Welcome back, everyone. This is the Cube Silicon Angle's premier broadcast, where uh, we go out to the events, the top tech events, to bring you the signal from the noise. We bring in the smartest people at the conference, and today we're at uh, DotConf 2012. That's Splunk's annual user conference. We're in day two of coverage. We're we're getting close to the end of uh, day two of coverage here. Uh, had some great guests on today. I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon.org, and I'm joined with my co-host here, uh, Jeff Brick from Silicon Angle. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome back. We, yeah, it's hard to believe we've been going here for, uh, for a couple days. I think we've had 20 some odd interviews and it's been in a great day. But the one uh, group that we haven't had is uh, our government. You know, how, does, how are your tax dollars being spent to, uh, to combat some of these, uh, these themes that we've been talking about? Again, I think compliance and securities come up again and again and we've had that a lot for today. So we'd uh, like to introduce Jason Crenshaw um, from the US government. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Uh, Jason is uh, knows a lot about security, and we talked a little bit about the, before the show about kind of the, the changing role of you know looking for looking for patterns that used to be like viruses and a pattern. You know, a virus had a signature as it's kind of a key element of security, but now that's kind of shifted because of the sophistication of of the attacks, and it's almost kind of this reverse what you wouldn't think of as really defining normalcy in things that aren't normal. Um, potentially represent a threat or something that, 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 that warrants further investigation. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you guys are approaching kind of the increased sophistication of a lot of the cyber attacks. Sure, so um, a lot of what you do is based on what you know. So uh, low hanging fruit, for instance, uh, viruses, malware, there's a lot of things out there that detect that kind of thing. Uh, as you get more proficient at it, you realize there's complete segments that you couldn't look at before or couldn't really investigate like you wanted to. So as you get more efficient, you find out there's bigger areas that are more detailed, more obscure, more hidden under the covers. Uh, and that's where really where you end up putting a lot of your concentration. And that's, there's a lot of gold in there. Mm -hmm. And so that's what uh, we really try to do now is look into those areas that we're not efficient in so we can become more efficient, so we can continually get more uh, more in-depth in areas that we never even thought about. Uh, hey, can we look at this, can we look at that? Those kind of questions never came up until you get more efficient at the, at the lower, or I'm sorry, at the low-hanging fruit at the higher levels. Right, I was going to say, you know, how is kind of this whole technology revolution around big data and some of the tools that have developed over the last uh, few years and, and, and are really starting to skyrocket in terms of, of capabilities, like you said, changed not only the way you do things, but really opened up new ways of doing things and going down new paths that you could never even, I don't even know if you could conceptualize them before or you could, but it was just too hard or too difficult. How, how has that kind of changed and is there anything um, that you could say that, that took you know, days or weeks or just absolutely impossible that now you can do in days or hours or you know, significantly shorter periods of time? Yeah, absolutely. So we had a, uh, a situation that came up uh, a couple months ago where we had, uh, uh, a product that was getting account lockouts. And so when we went and looked at that, we saw they were all coming from a single IP. Uh, that single IP housed a system that had a uh, very popular um, web-based appliance software package on there. Uh, one of the web developers ended up changing out the authentication module uh, without going through the change management process that we had. And so under the covers, that, that all took place. The end result is account lockouts were taking place on a separate system. So we have you know, an application, and we've got a system, and then we've got yet a different kind of system that it's all reporting to. Well, before, that would have been probably two months of uh, investigation with three different teams that aren't exactly IT friendly with each other, and, and a lot of finger pointing, and what did you change, what have we changed? And so using uh, a big data, um, consolidation product that it is able to correlate, uh, you can quickly turn that around to a 20 minute process. Wow, wow. So it, for us, that's huge. And was the, was the, I'm just curious the end of the story, was it a malicious thing or did the guy just not follow procedure? It, it ended up not being a procedural issue, so not following procedure, something very, very simple that uh, any web developer can do, changed out the authentication module and the end result is we had half of the workforce that was being locked out continuously 24 hours a day, which is, you know, a very big cost. impact. Tremendous Absolutely. cost. And it would have been, like you said, 
tremendous impact to, to try to sort out what was going on. Absolutely. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that, uh, what, what that speed gives you in terms of both being able to react to what really are malicious events and, you know, in some cases maybe they're not malicious, but they're still having an operational impact on your organization. Uh, so being able to do that in minutes and not in days or weeks, uh, how does that translate into real value for your organization? Sure. So uh, from a level up, uh, it actually gains you something for our, our analytical staff. Mm -hmm. So from an analytical perspective, you're always asking, what if, you know, what if this parameter changed? What if, what if this value changed? What if this time frame changed? So a, a, a tool that can correlate many different logs and big sets of data allows you to never break that chain of thought ever. So you're, you're, oh, you're asking a question, you're getting an answer. You're asking right, a question right, and you're getting right. an answer. So our staff can literally go through a whole set of scenarios as they're working and never break that train of thought. Before we had that capability, we would have to write that down on a piece of paper and figure out how we were going to answer that. And, and an investigation or a thought process, if you will, could have taken months to complete. Right. And, and in the entire time, you're missing another subset of thoughts that you mm -hmm. could never really act upon. And I think that's the real value of it is you never break that train of thought. You've got an analyst that's in that mode that's already doing an investigation mm -hmm. or trying to ask how we can make things better. How can we make it more efficient? Where is our big problems? And it just allows them to continually work, which I think is the biggest value of all. And, and have yeah. you found that, that oftentimes the insight comes on kind of the third, you know, kind of the third click down in terms of I started down this path, I went to that one, ah, oh, here, you know. Abs absolutely, and that's the, that's the piece that it's hard to put a value on, right? If I have an analyst that's into that third or fourth iteration of something and comes across a you know key ingredient that we can now pivot on and and do different things with you know that value is huge for us and we can react so it takes you not near real time but but dang mm -hmm. close right. fast enough that you can iterate iterate in terms of your questioning and and asking one query and following it up with another and if that leads you down a wrong path you still have it's time efficient enough that you can then go down another path whereas if you had to wait days or weeks for an answer to come back at that point, it really does lend itself to that kind of decision making. Yeah. Absolutely, and the other thing about it is if, if you're trending is long enough, then you can take those theories and replay against history and find out, oh, we could have solved this problem a long time ago, we just never knew we had it. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, so, so talk about the transition that, that you've seen in the industry uh, from some of those, from the earlier days when you were using either, maybe in some cases, just manual processes to, to do some of the work you're doing now, uh, maybe some of the more structured data type tools that we've seen, and now to the evolution of these big data tools, which really enable this kind of agile uh, approach that we're talking about. Um, how is that transition, how have you seen that transition uh, over the years, and how important is that to you, uh, to your organization, and what you guys do? Sure, uh, so traditionally we use products that would um, collect specialty logs from either uh, a couple of different applications, maybe different operating systems, mm -hmm. uh, and we would look at that, and, and they would have built-in reports, right? So you would get 200 some odd reports, and you would look at these reports and run them and say, oh, I, I must be pretty good, because they're all coming back green. <laughs> well. Um, Yes and no. Uh, so when you when you really look at that, you know the, the question is, how do they know what's right for my environment? How do they know this threshold's right? Um, so those were the traditional tools. Today's tools are more like, here's a canvas. Here's some beautiful colors. Here's some beautiful brushes. You go out and you figure out what is right and wrong. So it's really changed it from uh, what is the application telling me to. You know, I, I think this is always true. I think it should always be this fast. When it's not, I need to look at it and really get down to the nuts and bolts of what is important to your organization and, and, and what information is, is really needed to be pulled out of there. And I think that's the big piece. Mm. Yeah, I have large data sets and they're only going to get bigger. No one ever calls me and says, hey, please, please lower my disk space or I don't need <laughs> as much server. That, that, that's never going to happen. But what is important is, is that we understand ourselves we understand what should be true and not true, and having a tool that allows us to do that at speed. Yeah. So, you, you know, beyond the tool, what are some best practices maybe you've picked up in terms of do, doing that, really trying to understand what's important to your organization, and maybe share with our audience, you know, what are some of the best practices, approaches you take when you're trying to determine, really, what should we be focused on? So, um, it, it sounds easy to get started. Uh, what I did was I basically took a list and I said, okay, uh, I have a bunch of automated processes that are you know, provisioning accounts or, or making changes or whatever it happens to be. So that's a true. 
if that is not taking place, if something else makes that change, that's I want to know about that because I have an automated. So you start with a list of known truths, and then you develop a set of rules that say, if that's not true, what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. I want to be notified about it. Once you start doing that, then you get really efficient at saying, wow, well, these happen outside the bubble. Why is that happening? So then you build a new set of truths, and you just keep going. So you, you become more aware of what's going on and when something's happening outside of what's acceptable, alerting on it, reporting on it, uh, and, and doing an investigation, root cause analysis, whatever it happens to be. Has the, the change in the tools and the way the tools operate, and it was funny, Mark, uh, the security guy from Spunk earlier was talking about the two kind of thought processes. There's the one where you just kind of get an idea and cruise and cruise and cruise, then the other one when you get in the shower and you, you come up with the, with the search criteria all at once, you know, you have your aha moment. But have you been able to move kind of the investigation and the use of these tools either like down a pay grade, which is probably the wrong answer because those are probably the guys doing the, the grunt work. You know, maybe it's really up a pay grade where guys are now who used to have to query somebody else to, can you please check this out for me, can now start to do some of that themselves. And we, we heard from Ping Identity, who was just on right before you, where the executives were bothering them for, for stuff. So he, he built them a little application mm. where they could start to do some of their own investigation in the tools, where before that type of person uh, just wouldn't do that. I mean, they're just not data scientists, they're not database guys, they just wouldn't do that. Are you seeing any of that kind of expansion of use of the tools in terms of everybody, or more people being able to, to run queries? So uh, we do, we have a lot of uh, uh, app owners or uh, even low level analysts that want to investigate their tools, uh, usually for different reasons, right? Um, I'm looking at it from an operational point of view for the entire company. Our cyber team's looking at it for the entire company from a cyber perspective, but we do have app owners developers who want to understand more about, hey, if I make a change to this code, what's the impact? You know, is there a CPU hit? Is there a networking hit? Is there a retransmit mm -hmm. hit? So we, we, we do get a lot of that now. But what, what kind of excites me about using these particular products is, is I can bring a new person in and they can be a low level analyst, get used to how we do things, what we're looking for, and as they become more intelligent with the tool, I can move them up to change, so to speak. So it used to be in the old days that I might have one or two guys that are really just brilliant super brilliant, writing reports, mm -hmm. but they knew all the secret sauce, right? If they called in rich or got hit by the bus or whatever, I'm, I'm out half <laughs> my staff, rich. right? <laughs> uh, but now, uh, now with these tools and, and, and the built-in logic behind them, I can really train people at a low level, bring them along at a speed that they're comfortable with, and they become a true value to the company, even if they only have one or two, you know, pro prolific searches that, that, that we're using, it's still of great value mm -hmm. to us. Right. It helps you. It sounds like it helps you also maintain some of that institutional knowledge, so that when you, you know, when you call in Rich and uh, you know your your, <laughs> this, your analyst you count on is now no longer with the organization, you can still, you know, you're not back to square one. Absolutely. You can kind of, you know, after a short period of time, you can be right back up to where you were. Absolutely. So yeah. Sounds... It's, it's it's huge for us. Institutional knowledge is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just the fact that uh, there are people who have been through the counter steps, you know, starting at level one, going to level two. Just that piece of it is too, you know, a lot of a lot of places can't afford a, a main guy and a backup right. guy, uh, and really it gives us a staff without having a, a staff. I may not know what you're searching on all the time, but I can go back into your saved searches or your search history and almost reverse engineer, and within very short, you know, one to two days, you, you kind of understand what that person was looking for. Wow. So, now, and then have, have you or your team, or through partners, like we see here in the partner pavilion, really started to extend uh, some of these baseline products in ways that are very specifically targeted for your needs, or are you pretty much using the out-of-the-box version? So um, I think everybody starts with the out-of-the-box version. Uh, there's some government agencies that are in front of others, and you know we do have a very good rapport with the other agencies, so if somebody learns something that we think is earth-shattering, we'll certainly take a look at how they're doing it and what they're doing and what they're trying to do. Uh, we, we share our knowledge with other government institutions and try to um, get some, uh, at least some s systemic value of a repeatable process so they're not re reinventing the wheel everywhere. Uh, we all know that you know, tax dollars only go so far today and so any, any chance that we can uh, repeat and rinse, if you will, on mm -hmm. something, absolutely of, of huge value to us as well. 
Yeah, and what about uh, you know beyond uh, the government? I mean, we're here at dot com. It's a huge community built up around big data. Um, you know, some of the technologies are open source, not all, but some are. And so there's commu different communities building up around the different technologies, um, and certainly helping one another uh, in terms of new use cases and fixes for you know bugs and things like that. So do you? Uh, how important is that kind of community environment to you, and what you guys are doing and building out uh, kind of your capabilities? So it's it's absolutely key for us. Uh, we especially have some um, partnerships with uh, very large third-party companies. Uh, when we notice things, when we see things that we don't think is quite right, uh, we are on the phone directly with them is saying, hey, we've seen this, we've seen that, have you seen this? And a lot of times, we're the first ones to see it, we'll report it to them, uh, and they will take that and make their products better, uh, and, which in turn makes everybody stronger, right? Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, right. absolutely. Uh, we are in that business. Uh, we, we feel like as a government institution, we are a high value target. So uh, we take a lot of that knowledge and try to pass it on to, to everyone. I wonder, so specific to government agencies and, and government's use of technology, um, what kind of changes have you seen in terms of, I think, I think the perception is sometimes some government agencies are, are uh, slower adopters of, of new technologies, and that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, what's your experience? Is that your experience, and has that changing over time? Uh, what is it, the environment like when uh, you know, we've got all these, this explosion of new technologies and big data happening in the last few years, um, you know, how, how is the government, various government agencies, uh, are they picking up these new technologies at different paces? What's the, the state of that? So there is, uh, there is a disparity between all of them. Uh, not all of them uh, react in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when you have a tried and true method of, uh, you know, slow and steady wins the race, it's hard to get out of that mode. Mm -hmm. Uh, IT is something that uh, constantly changes, so that's the only constant that I know of actually in <laughs> IT. Uh, so uh, it, yes, it becomes very difficult uh, to do that, but uh, uh, and work with these different agencies. But the real the real part of ours uh, is to uh, let them know, uh, show them how we're doing that, and if they see value, then we hope we pick that up and and then can share that knowledge with them because. Like everything else, I wish the government was as smooth running as, as, as some of these others, but you know, it's That's very right. disjointed, it's, it's ran by different uh, levels of government, so um, yeah, a little bit of bureaucracy just uh, yeah. in there. <laughs> but I'm glad to hear that, that uh, at least the group that you're with are starting to adopt new technologies. I mean, the time savings that you illustrated on some of the things, especially since it wasn't even a threat that the guy just didn't follow procedure. Um, is great to hear, and I thanks for coming on to theCUBE. Hope, uh, hope it wasn't too crazy for you here under the bright lights at the, at the Cosmopolitan Hotel. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, it's been great. Great, well, th Thank you. thanks Jason Crenshaw. So that's gonna be it for our guests. We're gonna be back in a few minutes. Jeff and I will do a quick wrap on the show. I hope you've enjoyed your time here at Splunk Comps 2012 at the Cosmopolitan Hotel. Hope you've been uh, tweeting along and joining in the conversation of our data journey, because it has been a journey we've been kind of all over the place with technologies and customers and partners. Uh, it's been a great ride. We'll be back in just a few minutes with our wrap. <laughs>